I'm Leslie Short, the owner of the Kawa Group, and of course, your host of Visibility Unlimited and Visibility Unlimited, the spotlight, the video portion to Visibility Unlimited, the podcast. Today, we're doing a social impact podcast. You know, I love these because I have the most amazing people doing the most amazing work. So we're going to jump in because as always, I'm interviewing a very, very good friend that you know I will not share what he does or his name right away, but I will say welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Les. Of course, of course. So my first question to you, if you could say, start with I am, but please don't tell us what you do yet. Hmm. I am a son. I am uh, a friend. I am an uncle. Um, and I am a person with a passion to make a difference and make the world a better place than I found it. I love that. Thank you. So, but then now, who are you? <laughs> who am I as far as business? No, who, who are you? What's your name? <laughs> uh, my, my name is MJ Gottlieb. Um, what else? Uh, what does social impact mean to you? That's a great question. So social impact to me, um, often they call it the double bottom line, is um, aligning a your business with a purpose, a greater good beyond selling widgets per se and 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 putting uh, money in our wallets or pocketbooks. What are we doing? Uh, to take the resources that we gain to make the world a better place. And most people think that um, that profit and purpose are mutually exclusive. And I believe that social impact entrepreneurs key role is to show that not only are they not mutually ex exclusive, but social impact, i.e. the purpose mm -hmm. behind a brand will actually drive the profitability uh, but the end goal of the profitability, as opposed to buying Ferraris and 30,000 square foot homes, is to leverage those resources to perpetuate, you know, and accelerate the purpose right. that you started with in the beginning, if that makes sense. I love that. That We just need to put that out and just keep running that over and over and send it to every business. And so with that note, what do you do? I see you have this T-shirt on. What what do you, what's what's your social impact focus? So I actually need to redo this T-shirt because we just passed one hundred ninety thousand members. But um, so I um, I have a, a a social platform uh, for people who uh, are getting sober, staying sober, trying to get sober. Uh, as well as a lot of people call it a sober Facebook. And I hate that. I actually hate that okay. because a lot of these social media platforms are using uh, is a place for people to show their, you know, their pretty girlfriend and their fancy house in the Hamptons and their cool car. Okay. And that creates all this compare and despair and stuff like that. And I always like to say that we're the opposite of those types of platforms because we share our vulnerability and our challenges and the common bond that connects us, which is sobriety. So on the other side of it, we have a sober dating app. So we have about 190,000 members in all of which we opened up sober dating April 28th um, and have about 58,000 new members in sober dating. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Why did you start this? You, I've heard so much, and I don't want to say Rumblings, you hear something about sober, then I feel like it goes away. This is not something that goes away. It's part of our community. It's part of people's families. It's part of people's life. It's part of business. And yeah. businesses need to look at this because their employees, some of them may be struggling as well. So why did you start this? Well, I mean, first of all, to your point that you just made, the number one issue in EAPs right now is alcohol abuse, Right. Right. But if you kind of look back to the Genesis, you know me, Leslie, you know me 20, 
God, 25 years, right? Now, why do you have to tell years. people that? No. Yeah, I know that dates <laughs> us, right? But you were in some of the same parties that I was staggering around drunk, uh, picking fights with our common friend's bodyguard, right? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and putting myself in incredibly dangerous situations. But that's not unique to me because such a vast majority of people are, are struggling with alcohol use disorder and substance use. You have over 300 million people worldwide suffering from alcohol use disorder. You have 38%. Last statistics showed 38%, and this was pre-COVID, 38% of adult Americans suffering from some sort of a uh, uh, substance uh, challenge, right? So in aggregate, you're talking about over 500 million people if you look at, at the world. Um, and then if you multiply that times, you know, seven or eight, which is the amount of family members that are affected, you could start seeing the dynamics here. And so um, I got sober uh, by the grace of God, March 21st, 2012. So God willing, next month will be 12 years, right? Um, and um, I wanted to provide a safe and supportive pl place for people to connect and engage. Um, and also there's these stigmas of addiction um, that are preventing millions of people from getting the help we need. So from a selfish standpoint, my goal is to have Lucid have the largest voice uh, on the planet, the largest megaphone, if you will, to shatter those stigmas of addiction that are killing millions of people every year. And this is not about, and I want to be very clear, because there's an equity in this. I always like to, where's the equity? The equity is yeah. clear that it is not a color issue. Yeah. It is not an economic issue. It is a human being issue. Thank and you. And it also can run through families of generational yeah, so addiction doesn't care who the hell you are, Park Avenue to Park <laughs> Bench. It does not right. discriminate. And most people will equate an alcoholic um, from the, the stigma is the old man in the trench coat under the bridge, right? right. Yet I am in, I'm a big 12-step guy. I'm in meetings with, honestly, people that you see on television every day and Fortune 100 CEOs. I mean, it's it's just something that if you're an alcoholic, right, um, like I said, it does not discriminate. And so it's like anything else. If you have a, a diabetes, there is treatment, right? Where you could stay sober one day at a time for the rest right. of your life. And so that's one huge thing that you just mentioned, but addiction to care is a socioeconomic issue. So the average treatment center is costing, depending upon if it's private pay, it could be 50, 80,000 a month. If it's mm -hmm. insurance, it could be anywhere from, depending upon how much insurance covers, you know, uh, it could be 30,000 a month, 50,000 a month. And so uh, with Lucid, we try to provide a connection completely free for people to help one another um, because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have the good insurance to right. get care from facilities if they needed to be separate from alcohol and substances. So we try to deal with the addiction component of the that it doesn't discriminate, while at the same time give them access to resources that, um, you know, it's like less than 10% of people that who need treatment ever get it, right? right? So how can we remove that? And it kind of moves into this whole kind of equity and inclusion discussion, because people are turning, I don't want to say they're specifically trying to turn their backs, but it's kind of like, I think you and I have had discussions before about racism, right? right? And it's like, I, you know, when I would run into someone that, you know, that was, had a, a certain viewpoint that was, you know, let's say we would call whatever racist, right. or no, um, I just look at it as that person not properly armed with the information at their disposal, right? And so how can we best educate them Um on addiction in the same way that we can educate people um, on, you know, various things that they knew that, that that they don't know about either race you know, or women's rights or whatever it may right. be, it's, right? It's, so. it's an understanding and it's a learning period. And, you know, there is that, that equity component that I said, and you so eloquently put in regards to treatment. One, yeah. there's that stigma, okay? Black, white, yellow, green, purple. 
there's a stigma. There's a stigma whether you're in business, there's a stigma in your family sometimes, there's a stigma in community, in your church, in your temple, wherever that is. Yep. People either want to not pay attention to it or tell someone to go get help. That's great to say, go get help. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, like you said, that's not always an option to go into a treatment program that so many people may need because they do not have the funds. Yep. They do not. And it's not pending the insurance, right? It yep. may or may not be covered, just like therapy. Even That's a, not a fight you know, for therapy to be covered. But it's crazy that the seems like alcoholism and drug addiction or any type of addiction is barely covered under insurance. Yeah. Yeah. And then, or they find different ways to, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's barely covered under insurance. And then there were laws passed, which then everybody got in and then it was taken advantage of and all this craziness, body brokering and all this craziness happened. Then they had to draw it back in. So it's like, the the challenge is that there's people doing things in with positive intentions and there are people doing things with negative intentions what do i mean by that addiction treatment uh last time i checked was 42 billion dollar market size right okay. wow. a lot of people making a lot of money private equity backed venture backed mm -hmm. right okay. um and so how did they make money they put heads in beds that's what they call it census right so now how do you look at it? Well, if you really want to be profitable, you don't focus on your clinical model. So the patient relapses. And when the patient relapses, you could ring, so ring the register for another 50 grand. Right. So, we've so the way walking. society is set up is kind of like when I was working with the homeless is for you to fail, right? Mm -hmm. So then more money can be made. So how can we create a system where the treatment centers are changing their success metrics to get the person sober because right. if they get the person sober in effect they're losing money right. so it's right. this cre so there's all these people that are doing whatever they can to get people to relapse right the system's against the one staying getting sober and staying sober We're yeah yeah so it's like so a big conversation needs to be had and so with us as an example you know people like we don't accept ads in the lucid feed for treatment centers, but I will have a discussion with the treatment center therapist, a trauma yeah. therapist, whatever it is to see like what modalities are being used because, mm -hmm. you know, like you don't, you know, you, 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 it's, it's the whole kind of heads in beds thing with addiction treatment right. is unfortunately giving a mad, bad name for those treatment centers that are trying to do the right thing, making less money, but right. doing the right thing by their clients. Unbelievable. You you spoke early about, you know, you're in meetings and you're seeing CEOs, you're seeing business yeah. people, you're seeing a combination of everyone because like we said, it, it can affect everyone. But yet there's something that's not spoken about so much in business. Hmm. And I know we've had this conversation about going to events Yep. And I was at an event last month and a woman was standing near the bar and she was just like, and it was a specialty bar for her, the special event. And, but no one thought to even have sodas. Yep. It was one yep. cocktail that had a soda. And I overheard her say, wow, where's the water? Where's the soda or yep. something, whether she was sober or not, or she just didn't feel like drinking or it didn't make a difference. And I looked at her and I said, oh, there's a ginger beer. And she's yep. like, no, 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 I don't want beer. I said, no, 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 that's not, I said, I'm yeah. sorry, that's not what that yep. is. And it's a, like a ginger ale and you start talking. She goes, why? How do you know? I say, well, I'm tired. It's late. Yeah. I, I just want to yeah. some ginger ale to settle my stomach and go up and go to bed. And she was like, wow, thank you. But no one thought that at one of the bars, two of the bars to either one have a, and which is now something I'm speaking about at every event, have a non-alcoholic cocktail, mocktail, I should say, yep. right? That's cool that's in a glass because I know someone was like, you know what I miss? Holding the glass. Yep. Yeah. And I make a mocktail every night. You know, it's like, you know, it's interesting. And the whole word mocktail, I put something on in the Lucid feed the other day because, mm -hmm. you know, people are trying to change the word mock because it means fake, right? That's a whole right. other discussion. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, but I have a delicious mocktail every night. And the funny thing is, is um, 
your ginger beer thing. For my first eight or so years of sobriety, I stayed away from ginger beer for the very reasons that you mentioned. Then I was actually on a date and mm. the woman, I said, no, 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 I can't have ginger beer. I'm in recovery. And she was like, and? And I was like, what do you mean, and? It's beer. She's like, no, it's not. It doesn't have, it's like ginger. Oh, and now it's my favorite thing. I love know? it. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, People don't understand that for an alcoholic like me, when I used to go to those parties, the uncomfortability was so, I'm, I'll say the word earth shattering. Like I, I was so, I was just like staring down the bar at the bar, like a rabid animal. Mm -hmm. All I wanted to do was drink everything. And, um, and it's because you know, if there was this great mocktail offering and mixologist making ginger beer with agave and lime juice right. and jalapenos, <laughs> that's one of my favorite mocktails, um, you know, um, I would have been fine. And so how can we start really leaning into the conversation when, um, and, and one thing that helps tremendously, fortunately or unfortunately, I haven't figured it out, is the fact that the non-alcoholic beverage space will will project to do twelve hundred and fifty four billion dollars by the end of this year? So I say, unfortunately, because wow. I hate to talk about profit and stuff like that, but I say, well, fortunately, because people are leaning into the space. But MJ, I think it's 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 okay to speak about the profit because yeah. we want people to lean into the space. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Going I, to make a profit. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we know that off of everything. Well, so I always, I always have an asterisk. Is so my asterisk is the asterisk that I is for the following: mm -hmm. Are people doing this shit for the right reasons? So, as an example, you have um, so the so the so part of the NA space, the non-alcoholic beverage space, mm -hmm. are coming out with like fake whiskeys, fake gins. That scares me tremendously. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. for me, me, this alcoholic, if I had a fake whiskey, guess what my next next drink's going to be, right? A real whiskey. So yeah. yeah. So I love what's happening in the NA space with adaptogenics and healthy drinks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm scared about what's happening where they saying, hey, taste just like whiskey. Yeah. Taste just like gin. So, you know, like there's brands that want to advertise in Lucid, mm -hmm. right? That are that, and I just can't do it, right? And even though I think NA beer is great, right? I won't do it. And we were going to do a big activation with the, you know, one of the largest beer cup you out there. I was like, I can't do it because it's it's going to remind me of the times that I had real beer, and I don't, I'm not trying to like create a hard line. I just know that I am not the only, you know, special snowflake that would feel this way. Right. So it's like, so that's the kind of asterisk, asterisk, you know, I've never been able to say that word, but <laughs> that's, that's my thoughts on that. It's a little, it's a little. Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw this in. Is it a little bias? Yes. But is it reality to your bias of understanding who you are and how you need to move and yeah. how you've seen others react to it? Then yes. So it's not a, that's not a horrible bias to have. It's an understandable yeah. bias for good. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. just said that there's a bias. <laughs> there yeah. Bias. Yeah. Because I know that yeah. if I'm working with sponsees or whatever and I'm like, I don't want them having a non-alcoholic whiskey. It's just not a good idea. Mm -hmm. This person's a heavy drink was a heavy drinker. They loved whiskey. I'm not giving them non-alcoholic whiskey. It's gonna right. it's gonna instantly trigger them. So yeah, I, it's a good bias. Yeah. So then let's speak about this. There are some arenas that are having sections now that are sober sections. Yeah. I would love your opinion on the sober sections though I think they are amazing, is that segregating people away or is that just a better, is it unspoken or should it be spoken? Is that something you should be able to go online and book? If they're yeah. having sober sections and they're going to bring you this non-whiskey whiskey or I don't know, I call it beer, just what's your, 
Yeah. Because that's an arena well, and that's how they make their money off of alcohol sales and chips. Yeah, and and yeah, I know. Exactly. So, you know, the to the first question, I think sober sections are great for a number of reasons. We did, you know, one for, we did a number of ones at Soho House. We did one at Madison Square Garden for Dwayne Wade's last game at the Garden a number of years ago. Um, um, we did one at Getaway Bar. Um, so which is an NA uh, uh, place in Brooklyn, bar in Brooklyn. Um, I think it creates a safe and supportive environment where people share a common bond. I think also you could have, let's say, I mean, some of those places are are rowdy and you know the mother may want to bring their son and they don't want a bunch of people flinging beers at each other. And okay. like, it's a real thing. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I was at a convention and there was 80, you know, this was a, a recovery convention. There were 80,000 people packed into the Superdome, right? All sober. There was not a single fight, not a single argument, right? And it was like, I couldn't believe that I was in a stadium of 80,000 people. And there was, and everybody was like loving one another. So it's like, there's something beautiful that happens when people are sober. Uh, with regard to, you know, them serve uh, doing the non-alcoholic whiskey and all that stuff the non-alcoholic gin i mean i would like the there to be some sort of dis disclaimer or something kind of yeah. uh yeah. saying you know hey listen you know for people who have had alcohol abuse please be advised that this may trigger you know in the same way that it's like hey this may cause drowsiness you know kind of like kind of like that Okay. So at least you're bringing it to their attention that if they were a person that couldn't control their alcohol, having a non-alcohol that tastes like an alcohol may not be the best advice. Right. Especially yeah. if you're out and you're in an arena. But I like your comparison because I was yeah. going to say, well, why is it the business? Why do they have to declaim, you know, do a disclaimer? But it was great. You said, just like it may make you drowsy. Yeah. Disclaimer. So I yeah. love that you have really, and I know you're taking the time to really give, and it shouldn't be an argument, but the discussion on how this compares in our lives towards other things, that this is not a special something that anyone should be treated differently. It's part of who we are as a society. Yeah. And that you are giving a, another option and the dating option. I didn't know that you were doing that. So that's great for anyone that may be listening and looking um, reach out and, and and let me tell you it's it's big when i say it's big it's a big issue it's a very important issue because one of as a person that's been on and on and off again you know single uh the, invariably uh, me being a heterosexual man the woman would say oh my god you don't drink how are we gonna have any fun why don't you just have one drink oh come on just have one oh come on and you know like me working in the recovery field, I'm relatively sandwiched with my sobriety, so I'm, uh, I'm okay. But that pressure, most of my friends have given into, and it's re led to relapse and sometimes death. And so the the being able to date in a safe and supportive environment where there's not the social pressure to drink at the other side of the table right. is something that's very, very important. So we built Lucid Sober Dating and kind of left it to the side, but we saw millions of interactions happening right. and we we're like we got to do something with it um but we were focusing on building the community first and now we've really leaned in on the dating as well um and what it does is it drives our social impact what i mean by that is people don't understand there's a very important part of lucid sober dating so lucid community is free and it okay. costs us a fortune right uh, to keep it free. And the reason why we kept it free is because during COVID, you know, I, I would find people and ask them how they found Lucid and, oh, I just overdosed and I found it in a hospital bed. Had we even charged a penny, that person would have never been able to get to connect. And that person said, hey, I need help. I just woke up in a hospital bed and I've been using Lucid every day since. So what we do is we use the, the revenue from Lucid Sober Dating to support the growth of the community for free, right? So the one feeds the other and allows us to keep Lucid free in perpetuity 
And then in the latter stat stages, we're moving to uh, partnership activations and whatnot. Um, but that's for brands that are aligned with us that are to us, you know, like an NA brand. We're, we're speaking to a number of non-alcoholic beverage brands to incorporate and find ways to have a nice conversation about the non-alcoholic beverage space inside the Lucid Feed. So in other words, I'll say, hey, we're not doing advertising, but what we can do yeah. is we could do a mocktail of the day, right? Right. right. And, and so that's why it's a value to the user. But we're never going to charge the user for... Um, access to our community and when they come on the community just so others that may not understand they have the option to is it to speak with therapists or is the fact that you're speaking to each other and supporting each other and sharing great question so two things so number one community one addict helping another that's the principle that's been you know kind of uh since 12-step programs started in the 30s right? right um but there's something called outside help, you know, which it means professionals. Nice. What we're looking to do, and we're in discussions right now with three mental health providers, of which we're going to pick one, to be our specialists um, specifically inside the struggling section of Lucid, where people are just straight up struggling, and, and uh, we, where we built an admin control panel where they could speak directly to them. Can um, I throw something in really yeah. quickly? Yeah. For you to think about, and I know that you are, yeah. so you can tell me less, and you know I already thought about that. Yeah. But to also make sure that those therapists are culturally sensitive. Yes. Because having a conversation, it is different in cultures and drinking. Yes. It's different how you look at your, I mean, rock bottom is rock bottom. And we all know it doesn't make a difference what color, but it's not that part so much sometimes. It's how you're dealing with your family and friends and your society and your community. Yes. As yes. a whole. So- you know, percent. this is why it's taken us so long to find the right partner because right. of you know that the ability to kind of really give value at the same time and not just you know trying to uh book them for a freaking call right? right and so how and again it's not about not making money money is good if you put it in the right places absolutely but it's about not making money for the sake of making money and forgetting why you started this thing in the first place, right? And why you're doing what you're doing. So that's, so that's where I why think, behind the why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I I said this in a post in LinkedIn. I said people are using social impact as a buzzword to get in the door mm -hmm. for great opportunities, and right. it's and it's horrible, you know. And so we need to. Th to call out the people that are doing it wrong and play up the people who are doing it right. I love that. Yeah. So what do you want the world to know? Um, well, with regard addiction to addiction, that, that if you have, if you, if you feel that you ha are at the end of the rope and you have no hope that um, as long as you have a heartbeat, you have hope. Um, your chances of recovery are a hundred percent so long as my friend says it best. It works a hundred percent of the time for a hundred percent of the people that do a hundred percent of the work, right? <laughs> so um it's and I gotta credit my friend Mikey the boxer on that one. So it's like, you know, it it requires work because removing alcohol is you know, the price of entry, but it's doing the work on yourself that allows you to lean into life sober. So that's number one. I tell people, if you feel like you have no hope, uh, that's incorrect. Number two, say the three words that no, no addict wants to say, which are the very three words that will save their life. I need help. Number three, here's a big one. So people don't like the word alcoholic okay. or addict. And this is a big one. I'm, I, I always say I'm a proud alcoholic for a reason. Mm -hmm. So I have this fatal disease called alcoholism. My former literary agent had this fatal disease called inoperable brain cancer, right? right? Now I have something that's treatable and I can put my disease in remission one day at a time for the rest of my life. That's a hundred percent in my power. Right. Yet Mickey, rest in peace, 
my my former Blit agent didn't have that ability. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I have a treatable disease, right. I'm forever grateful because there, and I often tell people like, imagine if we went down to the terminal cancel ward and said, hey, guys, gals, or however you identify, here's the deal. Like there's this, there's this right. program. There's an option. There's an option. That you could put your disease in a remission one day at a time for the rest of your life. And so I think that, the word alcoholic or addict is has a complete negative connotation and we need to change that. Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, you know, I, one last thing before we, and I would like, and you tell me, I'm sure you've already had these conversations. When we think about business and we think mm -hmm. about employees and we always say we're looking for equity, we're looking for inclusion, but the reality is, we look for equity and we look for inclusion when it's best for whatever it's best for. <laughs> right. And that's always as the individual. And there will be times where now companies have started to open up mental wellness apps and being able to share that with their staff and paying for that. I think looking at something like what you have, Lucid, is another option that companies should be looking at to share with their employees that is, you know, uh, people don't have to give their name, they just can go on and whatever. They're, but to have these conversations, um, you know, there may be a time where the lunch break is running to a meeting and everyone doesn't need to know that, but there needs to be conversations that we are aware that this happens. Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get EAPs for the largest companies in the world to uh, have, be able to have an anonymous opt-in for Lucid um, and let that be, cost them 25 cents, you know, per employee Sorry. paycheck. It's nothing, it's a rounding error, mm -hmm. yet it would give them the ability to uh, have access um, to a community anytime they need, and they won't even feel it in their, in any kind of, you know, budget allocation. So, you know, one of the biggest end goals of Lucid is to work with, um, you know, large corporations, small to large, mm -hmm. and have them, um, you know, again, anonymously allow members to use Lucid, um, and so it's a it's a resource available to them. Um, I think it it there's just a tremendous power in connection when you deal with affinity groups that are struggling, you know. Um, and that's something that's one of our end goals is to make this available. You know, I, I should say it is available to everyone, but we need the help of larger companies to provide that exposure to their employees. Wonderful. How can people find you, MJ? How can they find you to invest? I will say it. You don't have to say it to invest. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. one for those that may need a community. like Lucid. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Well, so Lucid is available in all app stores. L like Larry, O-O, S like Sam, I, D like David. Then you'll see Lucid Sober Social Network, Lucid Sober Dating, right? Um, and then if they just want to look at, uh, you know, Lucid as an overall, the company, they can go Lucid app, A-P-P, like application.com. And if they want uh, any questions with regard uh, to investment, uh, we have, they could email me directly, MJ, like Michael Jordan, at lucidapp.com. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Wonderful. Yeah. MJ, it is always great to speak with you. I am... I don't want to say I am proud of you. I am honored to be your friend. As I am, as I am to you. I am honored for what you are doing. Thank you for sharing it with me. Um, you have always kind of shared it with me and I'm happy that you are sharing what you are doing with the world right now. Well, thanks so much and keep up the amazing work that you're doing. We need to we need to clone uh, Leslie's, but you know, <laughs> in the absence of cloning Leslie's, we'll we'll, we'll deal with one at the moment. No, I think one one's good enough. But I do <laughs> want to end with anyone that's you know doing special events or planning events. Please think about, as I always say, expand beyond your current culture. 
make sure that mocktail is there, make sure there is water there, make sure that there are options. If we're really gonna speak about inclusion, let's look at what that really means and who it's for and continue to build communities across the board. Everyone, thank you as always for listening or for watching. I'm Leslie Short, your host of Visibility Unlimited Podcast. This has been our spotlight on social media with MJ and Lucid. Please continue to follow the Cover Group on all social media and the YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Bye now.